famous writer once said, quote, there are only two lasting bequests we can hope to give our children. One of these is roots and the other wings, unquote. That's what this is all really about, isn't it? The supports our students need to steady themselves when they're shook and the skills and dreams to fly as high as their talent and work will take them. That's the promise of public education. And that's what we want to, li to, li to deliver with your help. Thank you. like 
licensed or unlicensed. And all ESPs deserve a minimum wage of $15 an hour. You secure the future of our communities by investing in community intentionally. Thank you. Alongside the traditional teacher preparation. 
And this is a sliver of what some of our underrepresented future teachers, or teachers of color, have to go through. This also touches on how we have to prepare our teachers regardless of representation. Numerous studies have shown that diversity, inclusion, and equity increases productivity, performance, and overall positive outcomes in a multitude of ways. Additionally, numerous studies have shown that teachers' prepa preparation matters and educators with proper training have better success in the classroom and produce higher achieving students. The more we can integrate critical thinking with regards to structural racism and cultural responsiveness within our teacher preparation programs, the better all of our students will do. I was fortunate enough to grow up living in two worlds, which instilled empathy, compassion, and an understanding many of my peers didn't have. Teacher preparation pro uh, programs have and will continue to evolve to incorporate multiple perspectives and voices. New, new teachers must obtain those experiences through high-level teacher preparation to be the most effective educators. This is in addition to the training in content knowledge, content-specific methodology, behavior management, trauma-informed practices, and multifaceted assessments. I help coordinate our Pathways to Teaching program. Governor, thanks for visiting. You uh, spoke to some of our students, so that was uh, really special for them. Um, it's a concurrent enrollment course designed to have students explore teaching as a profession through a critical lens and intentionally try to grow our own teachers of color within Duluth. They receive credit from the College of St. Scholastica after completing that course. Weekly, they go to a partner in elementary school and work with second graders. I see this as a part of a robust teacher preparation program, one in which the experience with the elementary school student is as much a part of the teaching and learning for the potential teacher as their classroom courses. We are in a day and age that content can be learned anytime and anywhere. However, critical parts of training are essential through intentional and structured preparation. <laughs> it's been through those students that I've learned that they're afraid of higher education costs. They're stressed about searching for money to pay for that, to pay for the cost of testing, to teach because of the perception of working in education. But I've also learned that they value fairness in education, they value social justice, and they value an education system that works for all learners. So I ask, what value are we placing on the education system if we weaken the preparation for those who are supposed, or are supposed to lead it? The strength The strength, of, the strength of education is very tangible to me, and unfortunately it's under attack. We need to be very clear about what's at stake. Changes to our laws and rules directly affect teachers and schools. They directly affect our children, which affects the very fabric of our communities. A bill will pass, probably, that will affect our licensure system. I urge lawmakers to pass language that protects talented and unique teachers and at the same time, the bill must preserve robust and culturally relevant preparation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today to talk about this important conversation regarding public education in Minnesota. My name is Kate Schmidt. I'm the president of Dakota County United Educators. I represent the 2,200 educators in the Rosemount Apple Valley Egan School District. I, thank you. I don't know if you all know this, but no one goes to college to become a union president. <laughs> I've been an elementary school teacher in Minnesota public schools for the last 28 years, and I just couldn't more. Someone has to stand up for our children. Today I'd like to talk to you about the importance of our freedom to come together as a union of professionals. In Minnesota, unlike some of our neighboring states, educators and other workers have the right to negotiate for a fair return for our work 
and to use our power and numbers to advocate for the resources and policies our students need to succeed. For the past three years, thanks to my great organizing committee down there in the front right, DQ has been talking to our members to find out what they would like their union to advocate for at the local, state, and national levels. We have held hundreds of one-on-one -on -one conversations with our members to discover the biggest issues they face in their classrooms. What we heard might surprise you. I know it did us. The top five issues that our members identified were lower class sizes. In, in order to form deeper relationships with our students and to provide the individual attention that their students deserve. More mental health support. Our students need additional social workers, counselors, and nurses to succeed in the classroom. More time for teachers to work with their colleagues to improve their professional practice and provide the best school experience for their students. Less time spent on standardized tests. And special education paperwork that interferes with student learning. And finally, increased teacher autonomy to make decisions that are in the best interest of our students. So the narrative that teachers unions only serve to protect teachers is truly proven false by our DQ members. They want to use their collective voices to advocate for stronger public schools in Minnesota. Unfortunately, when we brought these issues to the bargaining table two years ago, we were met with resistance and asked to stick to traditional bargaining topics. The district was unwilling to engage in meaningful conversations regarding their employees' deep desire and ideas for continuous improvement within the school district. Therefore, at the state level, we must continue to protect and expand our freedom to come together in union to improve the learning conditions for public school students.
My name is Matt Williams, and I'm an English instructor at Inver Hills Community College and the Vice President of the Minnesota State College Faculty. What's up? <laughs> Many of my colleagues couldn't be here today, but they wanted to make sure that I conveyed a message directly to you about how important public funding is for public institutions, so I have a whole bunch of uh, note cards. Um, you can see right that. <laughs> Since 1963, the faculty of Minnesota's public two-year colleges have organized around a clear vision of higher education in our state. We believe high-quality education should be available to all who seek it, regardless of who they are, where they live, or the challenges they have faced. And this is a vision that we can realize in Minnesota. Recently, the Minnesota state system requested $246 million in direct funding. $246 million in direct funding ensures that a student studying history in Thief River Falls has the same quality of education as a student studying welding right across the street here at St. Paul College. $246 million in direct funding means a single parent returning to school can get the resources they need to be as successful as a student coming straight out of high school. $246 million, that's not a bargaining ploy. That is the number the faculty and staff of the Minnesota State System need to deliver the results our students depend on and that you have asked for. So we know when some people hear that number, the first thing they will say is, how will you pay for that? But this is what all of us in this room also know. We know there's a tax code filled with loopholes and giveaways to millionaires and billionaires and multinational corporations. We know the extremely wealthy people and powerful corporations gain the system and pass costs along to working families. And we know there is a connection between our students who are struggling every day to make ends meet and the absolutely fundamentally unacceptable levels of income equality across this country. And so this is not a question of dollars, this is a matter of values. Values like ensuring our economy works for everyone. And today we are here to stand up for those values. Colleagues like our union family in Western Virginia, Oklahoma, Colorado, Los Angeles, Wright State University, we here today are learning how powerful our voice can be when we stand together. So we are here to lead America to a better version of itself. And Governor Wall, Speaker Hortman, Leader Bach, we want to lead with you. toward a more equitable, progressive tax code in which everyone pays their fair share. We want to lead with you to create rules to make our economy fair, open, and honest. And we want to support you so that you can fulfill your responsibilities to our public educational institutions and make sure public dollars support public institutions for the benefit of all, not just the privileged people. It's time to dream big. Our students are depending on everyone in this room, teacher and politician alike, to make a country worthy of their hopes, their dreams, and their talents. So together, let's make Minnesota a shining, bold, and progressive northern star that leads the rest of the nation to a brighter future for all. Thank you.
full funding for our public schools. We heard about the need for higher wages, training, and resources for our education support professionals. We heard about a public education system that demands the highest trained educators possible. We heard about the need for union freedoms and the ability to talk about what our students need at the bargaining table. And we heard about the dream for an economy that works for all of us. So that's what we've said. And now um, we're going to hear from our friends, because I know they have a lot to say, too. So we're going to start with Senator Bach. Please come up and join us. someplace. <laughs> 43 years a member of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and that union card has paid for everything I have. <laughs> and I'm really proud of it. And I am really, really proud of the job that your union has done on the, based on the assault that came upon you by the U.S. Supreme Court in maintaining your membership. So thank you for all of you the work in those teacher volunteers. <laughs> to, to make sure that this union stays strong. Uh, how many of you have a new Republican, have a Republican Senate? Quite a few hands. I need your help. <laughs> First, let me say greetings from the 32 members of the DFL Senate Caucus. Get me, get me two Republicans, and we'll pass a tax bill that pays for Governor Walls' budget. <laughs> You know, I'm of Finnish ancestry. Uh, didn't really know that until I just had my ancestry done. My dad, my, uh, my dad was, had always told me that uh, the Bach family were Swedes that lived over the border in Finland. Uh, he's not here today, so what I can tell him, ancestry does not agree with him. <laughs> They came back and said, I have about 3% Swede in me and 93% Finnish. <laughs> now, I mention that to you for a reason. I'm pretty proud of my ancestry in Finland and the way they treat and view education. <laughs> we have among the highest performing students anywhere in the world, and they view education. That society views educators with the degree of professionalism and stature that in this country goes to doctors and engineers. And we all need to work on that here so that teachers are viewed with the kind of stature in our community that the doctor that works at the clinic does because the work you're doing it is really, really important. You know, and I can tell you, in all my years in the legislature, and I'm kind of looking around, some of you weren't born when I got elected. <laughs> so if seniority's a problem, I'm one of the problems. But I tell you what, uh, when you have grandchildren and you're a legislator, nothing makes you think more about how important education is. You know, I was, I was here for my kids to help and do to the extent I could as a parent shepherd them through an educational system, and today they got great jobs, and they got great degrees. But you know, I might not be here for all those grandkids, so I absolutely have to cover on you all in this educational system we have. So I can just tell you, it's critically, critically important to me, and I have not uh, talked with uh, Governor Walls about this yet, so I hate to spring this on him. Uh, <laughs> but I have talked to his commissioner of MMB, and I've talked to uh, I've talked to his chief of staff about this. Uh, we need, we need to reinvent the Minnesota miracle. Yes. I'm going to share with the governor about a 10 or 12 page paper that was written about that. 
in 1971. And uh, it landed Wendell Anderson with a Republican legislature on the front of Time Magazine for what happened in Minnesota. And it took a while. We didn't finish in May. They didn't finish in May. Uh, they didn't finish June 30th. They had a whole bunch of special sessions over the course of the summer and the fall. And by October, they had a tax bill that created the Minnesota Miracle. And you know what? It was worth fighting for. And so I'm going to share, next time I get together with the governor, I'm going to share that story because I've got a copy. And interestingly enough, it was the History Center that did that chronology of the history of the Minnesota Miracle a number of years ago. So I have a couple extra copies of the magazine on that. I am absolutely with you. We need to think big. And, you know, it's a little late in this session to do that, but uh, if you really want to think big and you really want to accomplish what I think we all agree we need to do for our educational system, I need a couple more Democrats. <laughs> so I need... Think of what we did in 13, Paul Thiessen and I, right, and Governor Dayton, all day kindergarten. $800 million in the tail of that year. That was because, we, because we were willing to raise the money to pay for it. This legislature, this Republican Senate, is going to be a tough pull to bring them along to find some new revenue. So uh, I need help with those two senators uh, to, to get us there. But I just want to tell you, just in closing, that union card of mine, I, I sat at the bargaining table across the table from employers, my first contract in 1978. And I sat across that table every two or three years until 2009 when I retired, a long time, over 30 years. I deeply respect the collective bargaining promise and I, the collective bargaining process, and I promise you, that is not ever going to be diminished while I'm in the legislature. There is no way because uh, employees ought to be able to band together and negotiate on a level playing field with their employers and only a, the power of a union structure is going to give you the opportunity to do that. So. <laughs> because they're in the minority and their Democratic counterparts are over in the majority over in the House and they get a little frustrated and I often tell them, keep your eye on the prize. The prize is 2020. So, and we can flip the State Senate, hang on to the House and with Governor Walls, we can write a redistricting plan that's not gerrymandering, that's fair. <laughs> committed 
to ensuring that every child in the state of Minnesota has access to an exceptional education. No matter where they live. You know, when I was growing up, I graduated from Blaine High School, went to see my guidance counselor when I was 16 years old, and I said, I want to go to Harvard. She said, kids from Blaine don't go to Harvard. <laughs> she said, if your parents wanted you to go to Harvard, you should have moved to Edina. <laughs> yeah. That is not what we need to have here in Minnesota. We need to have, whether a child is in Browns Valley or in Blaine or in Edina, they have access to the same high quality education. And that means we have to fund education at the state capital. We have to not put it on the property tax. <laughs> to that upper 1%. It was really gratifying to raise taxes on the richest 1% of Minnesotans when Governor Day was in charge. Because you know what? Um, this disparity is hurting our families. And there's all this economic stress in the middle class and, and below that, and kids are bringing that to school. And that's why House DFLers are focused on putting those supports in place that kids need in order to come to school ready to learn. So our house file number one focuses on our littlest learners, but house file number two is about supporting kids in all those ways that they need to be supported so they can come to school ready to learn. We need more nurses in our schools. We need more social workers. We need more counselors. And we need to try something we haven't tried in about 20 years, fully funding education. <laughs>
and that future comes out of these classrooms. And, and I am more than willing to work with you on that. The one thing I would say is, I think every teacher knows this, uh, with referencing the working with Republicans in 1971, um, they don't quite look the same in 2019, I'm gonna say that. And the thing that I would tell them that I think maybe they're starting to learn, because classroom teachers know this, don't ever mistake my kindness for weakness. And uh, we would have and I, I can go through the list and I'll do a little bit of with you uh, of where our leverage is and where we get things done because you and every educator here in every part of it is results for those children are all that matter at the end of the day. It's getting the results done, getting the job done and I think us approaching it the same way. That's why I'm certainly proud that my president is here, President Smith. Thank you for that. <laughs> And, uh, but my peers are right here with each of you. Thank you to uh, all of you. Thank you for the powerful stories. Um, the thing that I would say, I would tell you this, Matt, um, the chancellor and his people need to bring you when they come and present a budget. Right? And I say that, I say that very seriously. I say that very seriously because when we do these things, and there's a whole process that goes with this, um, I was disappointed this year in the focusing on what the purpose of these institutions are, and the focus is giving those each and every one of our students, no matter where they're at, that opportunity to higher education. And how we how we go about doing that is what they need to deliver. That's the message that needs to be delivered. That's the coalition that needs to be built, and that's the message that we need to go to every single one of those senators that Senator Box talking about, and make sure they clearly understand that. So thank you for that message. Um, <laughs> talk about all across the country what people were doing, um, whether it be in West Virginia, whether it was in Oklahoma, whether it was out in California and in Oakland. But be very clear right here, what you did right here was you took a public school teacher and put them in the governor's office. <laughs> Time and time again. What we have got to recognize is 
Just saying it and pointing it out will not stop them from continuing to try to do it. We have got to propose budgets and pay fors that flies right in the face of that, that creates fairness at the tax code and invest in those things that build the economy. And we need to take that message to every single one of our neighbors to make the case for this. Again, they have made it, and, and Senator Bach sees this every day. Some of you in here, and I know the critique about me was is, we're afraid that, we're afraid that the governor might be too uh, bipartisan. He might be trying to, to work with them too much or whatever, because I, I do have a reputation of trying to find solutions. But again, I go back to this. Don't mistake my kindness and willingness to work with you with weakness. That is not it at all. Wow. But I am trying to, I'm trying to find that. But I told the press the other day when they, they asked, and it was about the, the cannabis reform bill. Um, and I don't say it was off to the edge, but, but it was just the, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. Um, uh, probably a better euphemism I could have used there. <laughs> more, not that. Um, but what I was getting at is I said, don't do the both side -isms. Do not do the both side -isms. I said Minnesotans are interested in attacking this because prohibition doesn't work and there's some massive racial inequities yes. that go into the enforcement. Now, and I, don't, I don't think like these things, but I trust adults to make those decisions. And I told them that we needed to have a robust conversation. So they have a tiny little kabuki dance here with cherry picked witnesses and six old guys vote for this. And they said, that's all we're going to do. Well, here's what I said. I thought we should have moved to legalization. They said no. I think at least somewhere in the middle would have been a robust conversation. We got no. I proposed, the, I think, a visionary proposal that makes sense based on the science that climate change is an existential threat to this planet and we need to move to a clean energy climate. So, I didn't expect it to become law tomorrow. And I think for many of you in this room, even though I think it's really bold, some people said, can we accelerate the time frame? Can we accelerate down from that time? But I said it with parameters that could be met that folks like, like, folks like XL were trying to get there and, and be with us on it. So I proposed it. Two days later, their leading person says, oh, there's a greater chance of me being the Vikings quarterback than that ever being heard. We're done with it. I proposed an education book, dead on arrival. I propose that we actually do something about damn gun violence. So have a hearing and vote on it. I propose a transportation bill and said we ought to look at how we pay for this. And I recognize that gas tax is regressing. That's why we lifted up the working family tax credit. That's why we viewed our budget holistically because people need transit to get to the jobs they care about and light rail and things like that. All of those things were dead on arrival. Here's my message to them, and they told me today they're tired of hearing this. Well, I said, that's a great signal to me, that just like, you know this, you show that weakness in the classroom, and they'll come at you on every single day. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, we're getting a little bit tired and frustrated about you talking about you have this mandate. Well, guess what? Three months ago, I told people and ran for two years, we were gonna fully fund education, we were gonna fix our roads by paying for it with a gas tax, we were gonna do something on gun violence and we were going to tax fairly and progressively, and they voted in historic numbers to say, that's what we're for. That's what we're for. We storm the hill and we talk about collective bargaining. There are some things that I'm going to make very clear with them. I'll negotiate on some of these things, but let's be absolutely clear that the people of Minnesota did not ask for the status quo to stay where it was. The people of Minnesota said invest in schools and invest in teachers, invest in growth, do all of those things. So now our chance is this. They're going to hold a group of about three dozen of them who were not up for election in 2018, and now the time comes. We are not, and I agree with the Senator, that 2020 is going to be transformational. I believe that we need to be there for all of those things. But here's the thing I'm saying is, you've got so many of your students and your families, they can't wait. The first sense of urgency is now. It's in this budget. It's to move forward. Students that need to get forward. We produce this budget around the idea that this is a holistic way of going about it. So that's why when you look at it, yes, there's more to do. But I also tell you, when you look at the education budget, Recognize that those students that you have that don't have a home, we have a historic investment in housing in this budget. We have a historic investment in 
MFib. MFib hasn't moved since 1986. Since 1986, we're still giving the same money to help families. It's a Minnesota Family Investment Program, for God's sake. Guess what happens when we invest in families? They succeed. We are not investors. So I ask all of you, it is preaching to the choir. It's where it's at. I am proud of this as a public school teacher and a proud union member, that we have decided that the things that happen in our classroom and the things that happen to families outside that classroom are damn sure our business. And that we better be our business. I would close by asking all of you, I know that there will be times when we'll disappoint you. And I know that it's important and send me the card. But I would also ask you, send 10 times over to the Senate and tell them to move their bus to the Senate. And let's just make this decision. Let's change the entire argument in this country. Let's change the entire frame. And the thing that you know is, and we've always known this, we don't collectively bargain for our personal well-being. We collectively bargain to lift up our students, our children, and our families and create better lives for all of them. That core piece of this is foundational to a fair society. And I'm telling you what, you're seeing this, they are not going to get it right and they're not going to lead in Washington. So let's lead in Minnesota and get it done. Thank you. Yeah.